Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I'm your host, Cheek P. John Paz. With me today, of course, the star Don't of the show, the former WW and ECW w. World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the Devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Great, P. How are you, my friend? Doing good, doing good. Can't complain. It's interesting. I always say the Devil himself, and I thought that was always your nickname. But now recently, I don't know if you saw this or heard this, you had the nickname stolen from you by MJF. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, good luck, though. What do you think about that? That's cool. Good for him. Is that a little homage to the Taskmaster? I, I, I don't think so, but it's uh, he fits the part. I mean, I'm a big, big fan of his. Huge fan. The kid is... He's the closest thing to stay in a character. And he stays in character, so it isn't the closest thing. He's like a throwback, and he's a great talker, great performer, and lately I've seen he's put on some size and he's cut. So he's got to cover all the bases, that's for sure. I've noticed he's definitely been hitting the gym. He's he's yeah. a lot bigger than when he was gone for a few months, so yeah. he's definitely hitting the gym and working out. Smart thing to do. Absolutely. He knows where he wants to go. He has a direction. And uh, I think that we're going to see, to me, he's this era of Roddy Piper. Wow, high praise. Yeah, and deservedly so. Why do you think that, though? What, what about him kind of stands out? Piper could talk from the beginning. This kid talked from the beginning. It's not easy talking when you're brand new, you know, because you're under the gun. You all your comrades are watching you. Uh, the tension's there. Piper never seemed to. It never bothered him when he first started, and it hasn't bothered MJF. I think he, he's a breath of fresh air. I noticed a lot of old school guys have nothing but praise for him. You know, they, they love him, the veterans of wrestling. They love him. Why is that? Like, why is he such a throwback? Why does everybody seem to be, you know, enthralled by him rather than a lot of other guys in AEW? Well, here's what I, I think, too. And this is no knock to anybody. We have a tendency in the wrestling business to steal from one another. When I stole, everybody steals. But a lot of guys are stealing from guys that didn't draw money. He's going to be the, may, if handled correctly, he may be in the Mount Rushmore when it's all done. He just has a special knack. He has the it factor. You can't put your finger on it. He does everything right. And the main thing is, to me, he's entertaining. You know, when he was in that show in Buffalo, when the people popped and he came out with the Bills jersey, and you got to realize, can you name me another professional team from Buffalo? Who wants to live in Buffalo, right? <laughs> cold, cold snow up to your eyeballs. He put Josh Allen over. The people were popping. Screaming for him. Ten seconds later, the boom around the building. He can do anything. That was great. That was masterful too, because he had him up, he had him down, he had him up, he had him down. I mean, he was very much like that old school wrestling mentality where you play the crowd. The crowd's not going to play you. Yeah, he he was doing Piper. I mean, I remember one time when Piper came into Georgia. And I had just, on television, squatted 425 pounds 26 times. Piper said, I, my hat's off to Mr. Sullivan. He squatted 26 pounds 425 times. I mean, just the little left-handed swerves. I mean, that's what I see in this kid. And he stays in character. And I'm sure it must aggravate some of these wrestling journalists because, you know, 
they think they're in on the uh, joke. Well, <laughs> he must piss them off. Good luck to him. Yeah, so he was doing an interview with a pretty famous radio host here in the Northeast, and he's going on and on, and you think like he's kind of praising the guy. Oh, yeah, you know, a lot of things have changed. And he's like, except you're a bald bastard now. Like, you know, he had the guy going, and then he ripped him at the end. It was great. Yeah, and that, well, who's the other guy? Van Fleet is his name? Oh, Chris, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I, he gives off that. Chris gives off a great vibe. And did you ever see the uh, interview with him? When he had him order him food, you know no, I mean? no, I didn't see that. Well, I got, uh, I, I like to watch Chris's stuff. I got to check that out. It was great. It was great. That's so funny because you think like, okay, we, we got the guy in for an interview. It's just going to be, you know, uh, you know, a normal interview. We're going to go over some stuff, and he totally throws some curveballs and some great stuff. I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, I do too. And the people do obviously because he's over. And I saw an interview with his parents, and you think his yeah. parents are going to say something nice? Yeah. They were ripping him apart. It was it was great. It was really funny. I was like, "Wow, I didn't expect that from his parents." Yeah, I thought that was fabulous too. I, I, they hooked me too. They got me right to the boat and gaffed me right in the head. Uh, you know, I was expecting the parents to say, "Well, he's a very nice boy. We're very proud of him." It was great. Can you imagine like a guy that's, you know, obviously the parents are in on it uh, yeah. to a certain degree, of course, but imagine like going to them and being like, I'm the biggest asshole on TV. Like, this is my character. Like, you know, as a parent, you're going to be like, wait, what? You Everybody hates you. And he's like, and you know, and now I want you guys to hate me too. Like yeah. he is going to a certain extreme, a certain level here. We haven't seen before. I love it. It's great stuff. Yeah. And that's why everybody's talking about. It. Do you think. Like, obviously, with Piper, he had, when he gets to WWF, of course, he has the Hogan. So, Hogan, Piper, that's the big feud, leads to WrestleMania 1. Who is the guy on the other end that could be like MJF's Hogan, where he's a huge star, where he could play off of him, where, you know, they're going to have a big back and forth, but it's like Batman versus Joker. Who's his Batman? There's two, I believe, in either one of that great. Brian Danielson or John Moxley. I think, and I'm not, this is just, if I was forced to make that decision, the John Moxley matches would be fights where the Brian Danielson's matches would be wrestling violence. I'm not sure you can lose with taking either one of those guys. I feel like Punk was almost going to be that, but obviously he's out for six to eight months with that injury. And there, there seemed like they were going the Punk to MJF direction, but obviously it's not going to be Punk. I guess Danielson and Moxley would be the, the two next good, good choices. And those are two guys he should definitely feud with for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's big money there either, uh, you know, because I think MJF can, I think he could draw with anybody, but those two guys are exceptional talent. You know, uh, when he was in WWE, Moxley, when he was Dean Ambrose, uh, he was good, but he wasn't this spectacular. I think he needed to go back to his roots. And he's, you know, his matches, I mean, I love how he sells. I love how vicious he is for a baby face. I think he's this generation Steve Austin, isn't he? Could be. Yeah. I think he wants to be like this generation's uh, Onita or, or Terry Funk with the way he uh, wrestles sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And just like, you know, the way he acts and the, all the blood and he loves the hardcore matches. It seems like uh, he's more of in that vein. And I'll tell you another guy that I put in there. Uh, the, the kid from New Jersey, I'm going blank. I just drew a blank. Uh, Oh, the kid that got suspended for pushing Janela, not Janela, the other kid. No, I know got, what he got, he got suspended. You didn't they, they? There was another two guys that got into a fight backstage because I suppose. Oh, Eddie, 
Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston. That's who I meant. Eddie Kingston. JP, can you edit it? Be not remember the guy's name. Yeah. Okay, please. Eddie Kingston is another one. You know, uh, I was on the card with Eddie Kingston about two months ago, and he is something special too. They got a great group of guys there. What do you like about Eddie? The way he sells again. I mean, I saw him take a bump, and I said, oh, he blew out his knee when he came back. I said, you okay? He said, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just selling. And the way he makes that comeback and that backhanded punch that he does, yep. nobody does that. He's just different. He reminds me of Dusty. Wow, that's another high praise for, for yeah. Eddie Kingston. Yeah. They got a special group of guys there, that's for sure. You have a different outlook than a lot of the other like old school guys. Usually, you know, the Cornets, the world, or even Dutch, and some guys, you know, they always rip on AW. They don't like this guy, they don't like that guy. You're kind of the, the opposite. You like a lot of these guys. I like most of the guys that uh, I, um, I know that, hey, it's evolution. I remember when I first got in the business, and this is before me. When Buddy Rogers started doing high spots, he called them sequencing. There's actually a, a university paper on Buddy Rogers bringing sequence in, into the rest of the business. And all the, all the guys at the time hated it because they were, you know, grab a hold and work the hold and lay in it. Every era is different. Now, do I think some of them do uh, too much? Yeah, because you can't believe that you can jump on the rope and hold a guy's hand and three other guys, as Jim Ross says, like a cover of quails. You can't do that. But how can you not watch the guys we talked about, Kingston, Moxley, Danielson, MJF, and think, check the willing suspension disbelief in the living room when they're on. I mean, I I really like, now, do I like everything? You know, but that's what wrestling is. It's the circus. If you don't like the, back when there was circuses, if you don't like the elephants, don't worry, the clown car's coming on. If you don't like that, the acrobats coming on. And at the end of the show, Gunther Gabriel Williams is the thickest head in the lion's mouth. So it's a little bit of everything. So obviously, what they're dishing out, the young crowd likes it. What do you think just in general of like that pizza guy, Luigi Primo? Where he, I don't know if you saw him, he flips the pizza when he wrestles. What do you think about that guy? I, I It's like uh, back even before my time, cry baby cannon. He cried. You know, did you ever hear who do you know who he is? Yes. Yes. You know funny gimmick know. but weird. <laughs> yeah, funny gimmick but weird. You know, so do I like personally like the gi No. I'm not a ha ha guy, but I know you have to have some ha ha in there. The greatest high spot I ever saw in my life. Did I ever tell you? No. Mm mm. Barry Windham and Mueller against uh, Adrian Street and Miss Linda. Bar the thing has been during the matches when Barry was wrestling Adrian, Adrian would try to kiss him, right? Barry would get out of the ring. So they're in the match and it's very big crowd. They do this spot where Barry's in there with Adrian, but they have the double knockout or double down. But Barry goes into the ropes and ties himself into the ropes with his arms spread eagle, right? Adrian comes up and looks at him. He takes out his lipsticks and just pours it on, right? He runs down across the ring to give him a kiss. When he does, Barry bends over and Adrian kisses Moolah. 
Adrian sold it like he had stuck his face in a cow shit. The <laughs> building went crazy. And that was in Florida where there was violence and wrestling. You need to have it, but it's got to be a little bit uh, make sense for your product rather than just throw it in there. Yeah, you're going to have ha ha, but I don't believe ha ha draws money. I think the willing suspension of disbelief is still there when they see the, the people we were talking about. But it needs to be got, ha uh, ha, it needs to be in there. Cornette had ha uh, ha when he had Smoky Mountain. You know what I mean? We, we sometimes forget, and I'm not knocking Jimmy, sometimes we forget. In our memory, the grass was always greener, the bear was always colder. And the women were always more beautiful. It's evolution. And they're doing a hell of a job, I think, right now with it. And both sides. WWE, too. I feel like AEW has some good stuff, some bad stuff, some in-between stuff. I mean, they're you know, like you said, it's a circus. Some stuff you're going to like, some stuff you're not going to like. I feel like MJF is definitely, I don't know, it feels like 90% of people would say that's great maybe not even 99 would say that's great character great television like he is like somebody to me flagpole guy when they originally were talking about they had these four pillars he wasn't being mentioned which was strange he's got to be one of those pillars got to be well i think so too and i think the people we mentioned i mean if i was starting if you and i were starting a football team and we had a draft how could you go wrong with choosing MJF, Eddie Kingston, Danielson, and Moxley. How could you go wrong? That would be a great draft. You know, there is a solid 10 to 12 years of drawing money. I don't see how you could go wrong. And then you bring in other things too, you know, I mean, uh, when the Patriots were big, they actually signed Doug Flutie. You remember that? Yeah. And he drop kicked that field go uh, extra point. You remember that? Had yep. been done in fifty yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, you could do the drop kick. Yeah. Yeah. So there are things that they can do, but I don't think they can go wrong with the guys they got right now. How those would you guys? Yeah, how would you book MJF? Like he's not champ right now. How would you book him? Would you make him champion? Like what would you do with him? First of all, I hate when guys say he doesn't need the belt. Okay. When I was a kid and I loved wrestling, I couldn't have been more than 17 and 16. I'm saying, this is horseshit. And <laughs> my friends that were bought it all the way said, why? First of all, I had wrestled but amateur 10 years, but I knew Andre should have been the world champion. But then they gave me the reason because he went to different territories and all that. So, okay. MJF needs to be the champion someday. But I think this is reverse psychology for me. I'd make him have to fight to get there. I'd almost put him in a... He's not going to be a baby face. He's going to be a heel, but I put obstacles in front of him. So when the time he became the champion, he was ready to turn. Almost like the reverse what they did with Roman Reigns. You can't tell me they knew people hated Roman, but they went with it because they knew he wasn't prepared to draw as a baby face First of all, he's too good looking. He's going to be in Hollywood someday. We all got to realize that. So enjoy him when you can. 
and he got booed out of the building, booed out of the building, and he took his lumps, and then when he turned, it made all the sense in the world. You could put, after that interview he did in Buffalo, you could put him as a heel, and the night he wins the belt, become a babyface. If things are thrown in his way. If he gets caught, we'll say in a title match, and uh, he beats the guy for the title, but the guy's under legs underneath the rope, so we go to instant replay, right? Right. And we, all of a sudden, the match going to start again. He gets disqualified because he's so pissed off. We could do things like that. They could do things like that for him, where by the time he came. The pe- it would be like Dusty. When Dusty, Eddie Graham never turned Dusty Rhodes. The people did. When Dusty was booking in, uh, w- uh, Jimmy Crockett, when S- Rick Steiner turned babyface, they, Dusty didn't do it. Dusty and I were together one day, and we looked at each other and says, how many more weeks can we go without turning them? And that's when he was with the Vasi Club. I said, the quicker we do this, the better off we're going to be. We did it about two weeks later. There's some things some people have. I mean, I could see this guy, and I'm not one of flip-flop guys, but this guy could have a hell of a run as a heel, and I think he'd even be a bigger baby face. You know, there's some things he's got going for him outside of the business, too. One of the proudest moments I ever saw was the Washington Post, the editorial system, when I had pushed Bill Goldberg, the head rabbi in Maryland or Delaware, or maybe he's even watching D.C., wrote a piece on Bill Goldberg. You know, back in the day, you know, the fighters were black, Italian, Jewish and Irish. He has a strong standing in the Jewish community. We don't see, I mean, how many baseball players can you name that were standout stars like Sandy Koufax, maybe Kevin Euclid. Uh, So he's got that going from too. So I think it's very good he's got a standing in that community. So it's, it, hey, I know in this day and age, we're not supposed to be tribal, but unfortunately, and fortunately, we're, we are. I mean, there's something, you know, when people say, we're American, but when people ask you what nationality are you, you don't say America, do you? Nope. Say where with me? Because... We still have a connection. My grandparents were from there. My mother was born on the boat. So, I mean, we still have a connection from our, the old countries. So I think, I mean, this kid can't miss. They can't, I don't think unless something drastically goes wrong, they can't miss either. Oh, yeah, hopefully no injuries or anything because you, you really can't miss with this guy. But no. you're right, I would keep him healed for a little bit. But eventually yeah. I feel like the crowd's going to turn a baby face because yeah. he's so over. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and I would keep him healed for a long, long time. I wouldn't do it in this, in a year. I mean, I'd make those people beg. Beg to turn him, you mean? Beg to turn him babyface, basically? Yeah, beg, beg, beg to turn him. Start cheering him when he's kicking people, you know? It's almost like Flair to a certain extent in the yeah. 80s when, when he was so popular, but you didn't turn him a uh, baby face, but he would get cheered a lot. Yeah, think about this. Rick Flair wrestled Ricky Steamboat, booed out of the building in Chicago. Ten seconds later, he was being cheered with Funk. Oh, down in Nashville, yeah. Yeah, yeah. was that Nashville? Yeah. 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 Chicago was the first one, right? Yes. Yep. Shy Town yeah. Rumble. Yep. Yeah. Man, that was crazy because that was almost like an MJF thing too. Because he went from cheer with the Josh Allen to booed right. Flair, che- booed against Steamboat, cheered 
uh, when Terry Funk beats him up and you know tries to put him to the table for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Switched. Yeah. And I think this guy has the capability of doing this. What Rick did. Did you see them teasing, turning him babyface, like slowly, like him thinking about handshaking, you know, babyface guys, and he, like he's. I don't know if they're doing that as like a tease or if they're really thinking about it, but they're kind of making him question things as far as like cheating. Well, I'd like to know what the end goal is because I think it. The, my head, you you better get this run as a heel from him, and you can have a magnificent run for the yeah, year, maybe a year and a half pushing it. But when he turns babyface, he's going to sell more merchandise than anybody that ever sold, I believe. And that's where I was saying that at the start of this, at the beginning, I was talking about the devil himself because i was getting emails from pro wrestling tees and shop aw.com that he has new merchandise with the devil himself and he wore that devil mask almost looks like you know your little horns and, and it says the devil himself mjf and they're making the little figures of it and t-shirts and everything else so he's doing the devil himself stuff but uh, i don't know it seems like it maybe could be a little homage to the taskmaster uh probably doesn't even realize that but good for him good for him i'm glad i'm glad everybody's doing well there. I'm glad everybody's doing well. WWE too. What did you think when they did the the controversial angle where he leaves the building? He doesn't want to work there. You know, he was gone basically for a month and a half, almost two months, um, and then he came back at the All Out pay per view and he wins that that chip. He's the number one contender now. But what do you think of that angle that they were doing? That he wanted a new contract. He wanted more money. They were trying to do the Brian Pillman thing. Yeah, and I think they had a long range goal there. But after what happened, they needed a stopgap. And that was the smartest thing they could have done, bring him back, get the heat off themselves. But, yeah, I think it was a Brian Tillman thing. It was a loose cannon. And it was done pretty well, too. Because the kid can do anything. Did you like that, though? Like, trying to be almost so inside? Remember he said, F you, and they had to bleep it out and, like, all this other stuff, like... Do you like that that stuff though, or was that kind of like too much? Like, come on, we know what's going on here. I think people knew what was going on, but I think some people still thought. Is I have some friends that are real wrestling fans bought into it and said, "All oh, these kids become too big as for his britches." So they must have had a great plan at the end of this, JP. And if we knew what it was going to be, we could really make that call but not knowing the full extent of what they had in mind because they had to bring them back right had them. it's uh and they made it look like he was leaving what did he take how many from what well how many power bombs was a six? Oh yeah wardlow yeah yeah wardlow it would look like you know that was the end of the wrap up and the goodbye do you think though that that was, I don't know. To me, it was just like I kind of. It's like this day and age, we're not going to fall for that stuff. But Tony, really, I mean, he wouldn't talk about it in the press conferences. He wouldn't talk about MJF. I don't. know. Did you think it worked though at all? Because to me, it, it didn't feel like it's just like okay, just bring this guy back, or you guys need him. You know, you desperately need MJF on, on the roster. I think you knew it. People that are really deep into wrestling know it. But I think a lot of people don't spend as much time watching and talking about wrestling. They're like casual fans. Like, I'm a casual basketball fan. You know, I know what's going on, but I don't watch it. And maybe because I couldn't be a center. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no 5'8 centers out there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just think... He did that so well that even if you didn't buy it, you said, God, this kid's good. That whole thing kind of reminded me, though, because there was a little bit of a shoot factor involved just as far as his contract was concerned. Yep. Because obviously when he signed, he signed a deal 
it was for a certain amount of money. It's like Darrell Revis when he was on the Jets, his rookie contract or that deal that he signed, then he's Revis Island. He's the best cornerback in the league. They don't even, I mean, it was like the Deion Sanders thing where they don't even look his side of the field to throw. He was, you know, he's a lockdown cornerback. Yeah. He was shutting down everybody. Uh, basically, Moss was like the only one who played, and maybe Stevie Johnson a little bit, but Moss was the only guy, who, and Moss is one of the best ever, and he had to do circus catches to make catches over, over him. So it was one of the things where he, he basically sat out because he wanted a new contract and you got to give him more money because he's Darrell Revis and he's had Revis Island and everything else. That was a little bit of shoot factor with MJF because it's like, Tony, I deserve more money here. I'm getting paid as much yeah, as Jungle Boy. I deserve, you know, uh, EVP money here. But I actually believe that that was straightened out. That contract has been straightened out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It I better have been, been, yeah. Yeah, I think actually before he actually did it, it was straight no. Do you like how he sometimes mentions WB and that he would go there and that Triple H would love him and you know this this guy yes. would love him? Yes. I, I think you know I think you know I remember the AFL American Football League, the Patriots, the New York Titans the original uh, L.A. Chargers, the Dallas uh, Houston Oilers, the Dallas Texans, you know, they, they, the NFL wouldn't even talk about them. What was it, six years later they merged? Yep. You can't, in today's information age, you can't not talk about your competitor, I don't think. And I think the way he does it, he puts himself on a stage where people think he's right. I mean, I'm sure WWE would want him. And I'm sure they want everybody that we talked about back. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. He'd probably be number one on their list, right? Like of guys to pick up? I think so. Young Unhurt. Just hope he stays that way. Yep. Now, one final uh, MJF question for you: Are You gonna go in there and uh, I don't know, maybe hand over the reins as the devil? Are you gonna be? Yeah, uh, of course. So you're gonna be in AEW. What? So you're gonna be in AEW no, to hand no, him over the reins? No, 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 no. He, he, it's his, he, it's his name. Uh, uh, that's a long time ago. So I'm glad for him. It's good. He's great. All right. Let's talk about the topic at hand here. Let's talk about Fall Brawl 1999, September 12th from Winston-Salem, North Carolina at the Lawrence Droll Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Attended 7,491. The tagline, Staying at Hogan, Brawl for it all. The pay-per-view buys 130K. Not terrible, but not great. 130K. I mean kind of would hope for more from Sting and, and Hogan, but 99 here, you guys are really floundering. Right. Right. What do you think about that? Like, not happy with it? Happy with it? Okay, it's, it's okay? We made too many mistakes going up to that. You know what I mean? Too much shit was passed down. You just can't make mistakes. You know, we talked earlier uh, you know, there's repercussions when you do big shit that doesn't work. And we were kind of floundering at that time. It seemed like there were so many title changes, too, in 99. Just like you had the finger poke of doom, and then... That was know. the biggest screw job. Not good. Not oh, good at all. The worst of all. <laughs> then it was like... Nash's champ, then Hogan's champ, and then, you know, they, I don't know, you keep just switching the titles. Okay, then Flair is champ, and then DDP is champ, then Sting is champ for, for an hour, and then he loses it back to DDP, and then DDP loses to Nash, and then Macho Man wins it, and then, you know, and then Hogan wins it the next night, and then he's feuding with Nash. It's just so many title changes and so much back and forth. It just absolutely, I don't know, it was crazy. That, they killed the title. Killed the title. They're playing hot potato with it. 
And on April 26, 99, when you had the two title changes, you had that long nitro, obviously. Sting wins it. He beats DDP. That's the last quarter hour you guys ever win when wow. <laughs> Sting beats. So it's like, holy shit. I mean, that to me is like a red flag. It's like, holy shit. Okay, maybe Sting should have held on to the title. You're winning that, that quarter hour. But then DDP wins it back at the end of the night. I think he pinned Nash to win it back in a four-way. But it was like, oh, my God. It's like you, you never even saw a quarter hour win after that. So, I mean, you know, in, in the year and a half left of WCW, so I mean, it just, it, that just sounds horrible. Then you look at it like, man, that is horrible. It is horrible. Very bad. So when you look at that and you, and you move forward here, where are you at this point in nine, in September of 99? I'm on the, helping Kevin, there was me, Mike Graham, Bob Mole, and I think that was it. And Kevin Nash, of course. So at Road Wild, Hogan beats Nash, and Nash is forced to retire. Did Nash do that angle just because he wanted to be like a booker? Was he injured? Like why? Why the angle of the Nash retirement? I think he wanted to spend more time on the booking end. So the thing is that may shake things up here. Two days before the pay-per-view, Eric Bischoff is fired by Harvey Schiller. So on 9-10-99, he's gone from WCW, and the pay-per-view is on the 12th. So was that did that change things? Did that rock the boat? Did that shock the world there that Bischoff's gone? Of course it shocked the world. I mean, nobody saw that one coming. Nobody. Why did it happen? I personally believe that Eric was undermined by the North Tower and what was the name of the guy that was the uh, program director at the time? Was it Bill Bush or Harvey Schiller? No, no. Uh, Bob Dew? No. I'll think of it. Bill Shaw? No, it wasn't Bill Shaw. Uh, he was the head of uh, Turner Entertainment. I think him and Eric had gotten into like a pissing contest and they actually thought they knew as much as Eric. And probably decided, you know, they never probably clapped Eric's back when he was doing well. But when he, because they could take credit for it too. But when it was down, they couldn't take credit for it. So they said, well, we're going to start the slate clean. And maybe if we get rid of Eric, we'll buy some time. Ha yeah. Eric has said, like, kind of jokingly, but that he wishes he was better with the corporate guys when he looks back at it. Like, kind of saying, like, oh, I was kind of being like a young punk, or they didn't know anything, and, you know, they don't know shit, but I know this stuff, but they, they're taught, like you like you said, they're acting like they know. Do you think that he could have been better corporately? Just maybe he put, put on the suit and tie and be, a, not a kiss ass, but, you know, we just be kind been. of a flunky. We all could have been. We were the redheaded stepchilds. I got nothing against people with red hair. Uh, we were the redhead stepchilds, but we owned that company. So we were all going to, they're all got suit and ties on, and we're all going to the office on the 13th floor. Believe it or not, they had a 13th floor in Turner's building. We were going to the 13th floor with our jeans and our. T-shirts on. Come on, we weren't being corporate. You know what I mean? Then Hogan comes in with a bandana. I mean, in a bulk, you know, uh, a bulk shirt where he's, his arms are, you know, look like mountains. And you know, it was just we were we were full of ourselves, and I'm sure Eric feels that way. He he could have played the game with them, but in another respect, he was doing so well, screw them. To me, they're 
just the corporate structure, especially after reading the Nitro book by Guy Evans, the corporate structure and like the way they thought of WCW and you know, some, of, some of the way they handled the books is just disgraceful as far as the way they, they treated WCW. It's almost like you guys were better off getting TV rights and having a TV deal with some other separate company than dealing with them and their production team and, and dealing with the North Tower. And the production team, uh, the basic production team that came with us every show, was excellent. But then they would pick up these other people, you know, like freelancers. Mm -hmm. And I know they went for the lowest paid people because none of them carried their weight. I mean, they're, and this is no knock, they're probably interns and, you know, people just learning. Well, you don't just learn on a multi million dollar job per week. So, yeah. True. So Bischoff is gone here. Does that change creative at all? Puts a lot more pressure on us. Do you have to make changes, though? Be like, oh, Bischoff wanted it this way, but we're going to change it because he's no longer here? Yeah, Kevin was very good. He didn't panic. He called us all back and said, let's see what we can do here. He knew that the water had reached first class by that time. It had gone from steerage up to first class. It would, the people in steerage were drowned. We were going to be next. And he knew, I think Kevin knew, and I think a lot of us knew that at this period, if they got rid of Eric, we might have been seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's a locomotive coming at us man it was crazy to even you know be a fan at that point like wait eric bischoff the guy who beat vince mcmahon the only guy ever to do it the you know the the genius behind the nwo and like all this other stuff like wow he's gone like how could he be fired like you would think he'd be not in the vince position because obviously he doesn't own the company but you would think he'd have that right where it's like this guy can't be fired i guess nobody is is infallible where everybody can be fired, but it just seemed like from an outsider looking in, like there's no way you could fire that guy. He beat Vince 83 yeah, weeks, you know, all this other stuff. They were taking credit too in the North Tower because over there, Harvey Schiller knew nothing. I mean, I, I saw, uh, did you see uh, the Redeem team, the basketball? About the pros coming back after the, after the... I didn't watch it. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I, I heard it was pretty good. There's a thing there where they're on the bus. And I don't know if it was Barkley or Jordan or even Michael said, fuck Harvey Schiller. <laughs> you know, Harvey was the head of the Olympic Committee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was his background? Wasn't it like a military background or he's something? I know he's boys guy. with Ted Turner. He was a military guy, yeah. Yeah. Way out of his league. I was going to say, like, how does he fit in with sports and, and, I don't have and any WCW idea. and Bischoff? I don't have any idea. Because I remember that storyline on TV. Remember you guys brought him in and he fired Bischoff on TV? Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be weird. He fires him on TV uh, six yeah. months later. He he fi <laughs> fires him for real. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. The only thing was Bischoff was still getting paid, right? So he, he got yeah. let go, but he he's still getting paid. Yeah. And then when they brought him back, they had to give him more money. Good for Eric. That's like uh, Bray Wyatt. Now he got fired. Now he's making more money coming back, working less dates. Good for him. That crazy how that works out? It's like, wait a second. You fire the guy. I guess you probably regret firing him. You have to bring him back because he's a huge merch seller and, and and obviously a pretty good draw for them, but you gotta pay him more money. It just to me that that's always hilarious. It's like, wow, what a mistake. Now you made two mistakes. Firing him and rehiring him, you gotta pay him more money. Well, I'm a big fan of the Mulligan Wyndham clan, the extended the rotunda, you know, uh Mike, I'm a big fan of theirs, and I'm glad they're getting. He's doing well. 
when you look at just at this point, WSW in 99, it's like, okay, kind of floundering, 130 buys, not great. Then you look at WWF, they did 330,000 buys. You know, it's it's not like they have put on a, a huge pay-per-view. Austin is, is injured. He's not wrestling on the show. You know, Triple H is about to win the title. They're kind of they're kind of going in a different direction, but they're really headed up. No matter what is happening to them, they're still headed up, and they're still you know really doing well. So three thirty for a September pay per view for them is pretty good because it's unforgiven. It's like a nothing pay per view, but three thirty two hundred thousand more than what you guys are doing. Absolutely, absolutely. They had capture the people's trust. We are pissing away. So do you think Yellow and Red Hogan, who had just returned, do you think that's the right direction to go? No. No. Is that Hogan, though? Is that creative control putting you yeah, in that direction? Of course. Of course. Of course. When that happens, does anybody say to him, like, Hulk, it's late 99, it's about to be 2000, I don't know about this? I think Kevin might have. But I think Kevin was smart enough to pick his battles. And he probably went and talked to him. This I'm assuming. He probably went and talked to him, but realized that it was an impossible task. And he assumed right. And I'm not knocking Hulk for this. It was his name that brought everybody over made uh, WCW an entity but you know it, it, there was other problems that came with it younger guys weren't being pushed or if they were like the Pil Pillman thing he wanted to wrestle in the first out oh, no you know a shitty little angle instead of letting Pillman go get built up. There was a lot of things, and it wasn't just Hulk's problems. They were exasperated by too much. Just too much. It's funny, though, when you look at three years later, WWF, when Hogan comes back, or WWE, I guess you could say. It's really WWF, but then it becomes WWE. But he goes back to the yellow and red, and it's over, man. They sold so much merchandise from him that year. It was crazy. So it was almost like the timing has to be right for the yellow and red. 99 WCW wasn't the right timing. 2002 WWF was. Right. And the other thing is he went away from his own WWF. It was like you were welcoming them back, everybody. For sure. They were loving the, the return of Hulk Hulkamania. They basically, you know, Triple H had just won the title. Hogan wins it the month later. Triple H wasn't over as a babyface. Old, uh, quote-unquote, old Hulk Hogan was. They wanted the nostalgia, and they wanted Hulkamania. So literally ended Triple H's title run in a month. Right, right. So when you look at this, Fall Brawl 99, it's an interesting show because it's going to be a little bit of a change because Bischoff's gone, but Hogan Sting is the main event. That's kind of old reliable. You know what I mean? Like they were the, the biggest draw ever for WCW. Is that the thinking? Like we're going to go to the well no, again because Hogan and Sting was no, such a big that, draw? The, the advertisers have been out before Eric left. But just creatively in general – Going to Hogan Sting, going that well, is that like you almost like a, going? You had a, the advertising was out before Eric left. But even when you guys were building it up, were you thinking like, okay, hopefully Hogan and Sting can, you know, yeah, they did yeah, 700,000 right. 700, buys of Starcade. Like, hopefully we can get that buzz going again with those two? Yeah, I think so. But, but I think at this point, we knew. You know what I mean? I think. Uh, Kevin turned to me, Bob, Mike Graham, and said, lovely playing with you gentlemen. Let's continue <laughs> to play. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, like with Sting and Hulk is, and oh, we'll get to obviously the main event in a little bit, but Sting is the one that's going to turn heel. Like, is that a you guys' decision? Is that a Hogan decision? Like, did somebody need to turn heel? Like, why is Sting going to be heel? Is it because Hogan was, was just heel and now he just turned baby? I guess so. I mean, 
there were things that we didn't know about the main event. I'm sure Kevin did, and he kept his mouth quiet so he wouldn't upset us. But, I mean, Turner's thing heel was not the right thing to do. We know that. But he wanted to sell merchandise. To me, and it's crazy to say this, but in WCW, if you have Sting, he just can't he can't be a heel. He's not going to get booed. It's I mean, it's it's a fact. I mean, if you put him out there, he's getting cheered. Even when he kind of turns on Hogan and beats him up with the he wasn't really getting booed. And he's with Luger, so you know you're really trying. It it, it didn't work because the crowd almost liked it in a, in a weird way. Yeah, they were always for him. It didn't matter. He had a special I, presence. He, they saw him grow up from the Venice Beach boy with the f- fancy jackets and the face, colorful face paint to the crow. I feel like he's the French. Well, he obviously was the French, yeah. but he's like their guy. Like yeah. they're not going to boo their guy. He's their guy. Right. And it's almost like a, you know, Schwarzenegger, you know, he'll be the, the star of an action movie. He does something heelish. You're not going to boo him and think he's the bad guy. He's just, he's a good guy. He's going to do bad things. Right. Right. So to me, that feels like Hogan had to have gotten a hold of Nash or maybe you or, you know, the committee was like, you know what? Let's turn Sting heel and, and I'm going to stay face. But I feel like you guys were probably like, I don't know if this is going to work. I think we all knew Turner's thing was the wrong thing to do. Which crazy to think is you like Sting and Hogan. Now, Hogan's way more popular, but not to that loyal WCW base. They like Sting. I mean, yeah. and they like to boo Hogan a lot, a lot of the times. They sure did. So the pay per view starts. It has a nice little video package for Hogan and for Sting. And they, you know, they're teasing Lex Luger's involvement, which obviously is kind of foreshadowing. Sting kind of going to the dark side with Luger and being a heel. You got Shivani Heenan and Mike Tanay on the call. Your uh, your favorite uh, trio, right? You love those guys. And the first match up is the six man tag match: the Filthy Animals, which is Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, and Billy Kidman versus Shaggy Two Dope, Violent J of the Insane Clown Posse, and Vampiro. What do you, what do you think just of ICP just in general with? WCW wrestling and being on the first match of the card. I mean, you know, they sell, if this is correct, they sell the second most merchandise in the rock and roll business next to Sting. I mean, uh, uh, Kiss? Kiss, yeah, sorry. Really? ICP, wow. Yeah. They have a huge following. Those juggalos, they follow them everywhere. You're breaking up again. You're breaking up, Bubba. Those those juggalos follow um, them everywhere. I feel like they got such a big following that they they love them. The the juggalos... Breaking up. The juggalos have their little, um, I guess, festival. Still nothing? I can't hear you, JP. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. I hear you, but you're reverbing like you did last time. I wonder I wonder why that is. Weird. What about now? What about now? Hello, hello, hello. Better. Oh, better? Okay. Maybe you gotta stay closer here to No, you. I got it again. It's 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 something that you must move during the uh, something's loose because it almost happens every week, right? Yeah, it, it happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're perfect. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Say so I was saying the Juggalos have such a big following; they have festivals, and yeah. I mean those fans travel everywhere for them. Yeah. So I guess you know our idea was to bring them in. You know, I guess it was the forerunner. Of uh, Bad Bunny, right? Yes. And I think that's what they were looking to do and uh, to widen our audience, which wasn't a bad idea. 
So the filthy animals, Ray, Eddie, and Kidman win over Vampiro and ICP in about 14 minutes. So good opener. Actually, good match. ICP look good. I mean, obviously, you're wrestling Eddie and Ray. You're probably, you know, they, they're looking to look like a million bucks, even if they suck. But they were actually pretty good. They were pretty decent, uh, you know, being surprised. I know they're huge wrestling fans. And obviously, Vampiro carried it quite a bit, too. But 14 minutes seemed long, but it was a good match. Yeah, it, I remember that match because I was shocked. I give the give the posse the do. I never thought they'd be able to do as well as they did, and they did. Ray here, he seemed to be having a bit of the injury bug in WCW. Again, again your microphone. Damn, I'm trying not to move. Hello, hello. So, can you hear me now? Are you okay now? Can you hear me better now? Let's do it again. Damn, I wonder what that is. Weird. Very weird. It's rebounded, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. Echo Box. I don't know what the hell's going on with that. That's now weird. you're okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'll try to uh, keep it that way. So, uh, Mysterio gets injured, oh, though. Fuck. Look. Now it's doing it again. Damn. I wonder what that is. I wonder what that is. Do you think it's your plug in? And hopefully that did something. I'm not sure if it did or not. Still doing it now, or is it better? Oh, no, now it's great. All right, so Mysterio hurts his knee in the match, or it looks like a knee injury. Bobby the Brain jokingly says, "Look at him; he's too lazy to walk to the ring by you know to the back, by, or walk from the ring to the back by himself." Typical hedonism, huh? Very funny. Yes. Then the next matchup. Well, actually, before I get to fourteen minutes, is that too long for ICP, or is that okay? No, because you've got two of the greatest performers of all times, right? Ray and Eddie. Yep. It's not, they're not even breaking a sweat yet. Then the next match is a cruiserweight championship match. Lenny Lane, who's the champion with Lodi, defeats Kaz Hayashi in about 12 minutes to retain the cruiserweight title. Pretty damn good match, actually, from, from those two. Do you like having the, the uh, cruiserweights kind of be two guys we may not be as familiar with here in 99. There's a good way to give them exposure. You know, we are looking really, I think Kevin was looking at who could rise above this fray and help him out. To me, great match, but it was like almost like a little bit of a coming out party because We've seen Lenny Lane before. It was like, wow, holy shit. Like, that was a damn good job. And obviously, Kaz Ayashi's pretty young to business at this point. We'd find out that he's really good. But that was, to me, a, a coming out party for both those two guys. Right, right. And they did a great job. Were you trying to make the Cruiserweight division what it used to be? Because a few years earlier, the Cruiserweight division was probably the best. Yeah, of course we were. You know, we were dumped. This was dumped in our lap, or Kevin's lap. And we knew... You know, we're going to go back to what worked before with different guys. And so then, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so then you think that you can get it back to the level it was as far as the cruiserweights, or that's impossible? We got to get people watching the show first. Good division, though, like as far as some good building blocks, because obviously you still have a, a ready. Uh, Ray, excuse me, easy for me to say, Ray, Eddie, Kidman, you still have some guys that are cruiserweights, but maybe have moved beyond the cruiserweight division as they're moving up the, up the up the ladder. Right, right. So then we have Sting in the ring with Mean Gene Oakland. He kind of teases that he's done with Luger. Obviously, this is part of the swerve, that he's done with Luger. Maybe they shouldn't be friends anymore, and that Hogan's been on the straight and narrow, but he doesn't particularly trust Hogan. So Maybe I should have been smart in realizing it, but I didn't think about it when I was a fan. Like, definitely swerving us completely until we get to the end of the show. I mean, he's definitely swerving us, saying that he's not with Luger and that Hogan may be the, the villain. Right. 
that just a just a tease, just to throw it out there, just to kind of keep it yeah, in your mind? Yeah, and it also to f- foreshadow what was going to happen on the show. You know, S- definitely great to put the dots together. Then we have a no DQ match. The first family, Brian Knobs and Hugh Morris with Jimmy Hart versus the Revolution. Your buddy, the franchise, Shane Douglas and Dean Malenko. The first family wins at this no DQ match in about nine minutes and 30 seconds. That's a shocking decision there. Douglas and Malenko end up losing to Knobs and Hugh Morris. What, what, do you, what do you think about that? Never heard a word. Never heard a word of your, what you just said. What do you think of the first family? Never, hum- Bill, I'd never hear it. No. JP, is this when you lean back? Because when you. I don't know. Weird. The, what? I don't know. It's weird because it was working before I was back, but now I, I moved it's myself. Still doing it. It's still doing it. Damn. Now you're okay. Ah. I'm going to try to, maybe I'll try to lean this way, I guess. Maybe stay over here. Yeah. So Hugh Morris and Brian Knobs beat Shane Douglas and Dean Malenko of the Revolution in no DQ match, nine minutes, 30 seconds. What do you think? There? That seems like a surprising decision to have Shane and Malenko of the Revolution, who seemed like they were getting a push to, to lose. Yeah. Uh I think the plan was we had gotten too complacent that people could figure out finishes. I think Kevin wanted to shake things up. And rightfully so. A lot of 50 50 booking, though, because the revolution will win, then they'll lose. It seemed like they never kind of got a good footing. It was a never really a good push for revolution because they never quite got on a roll momentum wise. Later on, you mean? Or. During this period, it was like they won, they lost, they won, they lost. It was never like they never got on a roll. Right, right. Now, there might have been some problems with one of them with Kevin. I don't know if there was, but I think it could have been. And, you know, Kevin wanted everybody to be loyal, and he was right. And I'm not sure that everybody there was loyal to Kevin. I just wonder if they were to get a good push, like Malenko, like would they have wanted to stay? Because obviously a few months later they want to leave. Like I wonder if they would have wanted to stay had the revolution been booked better and and had things been kind of going more their way. Maybe, probably. Everybody wants the push, you know what I mean? This was surprising because Knobs and Morris in 99 weren't usually getting a lot of wins. So that kind of threw me for a loop, too, because I definitely thought the Revolution was going to get the win there. Yeah, and again, it's Kevin trying to shake things up, I believe, you know. Eric just... uh, I'm sure there was a conversation from the North Tower with Kevin. Hey... What this been doing before hasn't working. Kevin want to at least show them that he got the message, I guess. So the next matchup, Rick Steiner defeats Perry Saturn to retain his television championship in nine minutes, 23 seconds. Rick Steiner, Saturn, pretty good match, pretty good hard hitting match. Seemed like Rick Steiner was getting a bit of a push here. Like, you know, he's a TV champ, but he hadn't really lost in a while. He was getting a lot of big wins. Yeah. Nash and Rick are very dear friends, and Nash saw the uh, ability that Rick has. We all did, right? Rick Steiner is one of the best. Love Rick Steiner. Yeah. Here, they go to the back, and Oakland is now interviewing Hogan. Hogan says he won't stay up staying in the back. It'll be a straight-up match, and that if he wanted to turn on him, he would have done it already. Again, teasing something there, right? He just right. kind of keeps teasing something's going to happen. Yeah, putting the dots out there. Uh, you chum in the water, you know, you just keep on throwing bait out. You got the hook set. 
you're going to grab something because you're going through the chum bucket pretty good. They also mentioned Buff Bagwell was scheduled to be in the next match, but he's not in the building. So they mentioned that there will be a replacement. Where was Buff? Was he really injured? Like what happened to Buff at this point? Or did he no show? Was he having some no. extracurricular problems? No, I think he was uh, hurt. I think he was hurt at this time. I think he had a knee or shoulder injury. So we get Berlin, who's Alex Wright with this new German gimmick with the wall, defeating Hacksaw Jim Duggan in about eight minutes. Nothing great here, nothing to write home about. It's almost like Germany versus U.S. This is almost like, you know, like a little bit of like a throwback to 1945, <laughs> World War right. II kind of stuff. Um, what do you think about Berlin, Alex Wright, that just that gimmick? Like he's way different than what we're normally seeing of, out of Das Wunderkind. I think it could have been done well, but, going, you know, remember the original video? It looked like there was marches in the street of Berlin. Remember that? Nah, come on. Come on. We don't need to go back to Hans Schmidt and the Bob Bronner's giving goose stepping and giving the Nazi salute. Come on. We're better than that. That was a weird, weird gimmick there. That almost seemed, and it wasn't Russo because this is right before he comes in, but that almost seems like a Russo gimmick. <laughs> Berlin with the wall, like just yeah. you know, it just seems like it to me, but obviously it was not. Yeah. So then Buff comes out. Buff Bagwell comes out, said his plane was late. He just missed the match. He kind of confronts Duggan. It doesn't look like you know he be, can wrestle, whatever. So he must have been hurt, but they kind of tease something with Buff and Duggan and they kind of go away and they go to a video package. But just interesting there, like maybe did you no buff was hurt, but you wanted him on the card anyway, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, I think so. And they wanted to give Berlin get Berlin that spot and continue something. I think Kevin's idea was to get a three way between those guys and then eventually break into tags with the wall of Berlin against Buff and uh Jim. So then we go to the next match. Harlem Heat, Booker T and Stevie Ray defeated the West Texas Rednecks. Barry Windham and Kendi, Kendall Windham with Kurt Henning on the sideline. Harlem Heat wins the tag team championships in 13 minutes. What do you think here? I guess maybe it was Hennig injured that he gets filled in with uh, Kendall yeah. here? Yeah, exactly right. And why not? They, to me, they always talk about great tag teams. I don't hear the Harlem Heat mention that often. To me, they were exceptional. Love them. One of the greatest tag teams. Of this is their ninth reign here. They end up winning it ten times. But, man, they're definitely one of the best. they got to be top ten, one of the greatest tag teams. I think so. I definitely think so. Do you like the West Texas Rednecks? Do you like that gimmick? No. It's... Hey, I didn't living in Florida for so long. I don't think I'm a East Coast guy anymore, really, but that's where my, I grew up. I just thought that was way too Southern. Rap is crap, remember? Rap is crap, yeah. that, that song. Yeah, that was a great song. Yeah, a great song, but it wouldn't stand up today, would it? <laughs> Probably not. Uh <laughs> Every one of them is a multi-billionaire. You got to love it, though. Rap is crap. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So the next match, you have Sid Vicious defeating Chris Benoit to win the United States Championship in 11 minutes and 50 seconds. Pretty good match here. Not great. They would have a better match, obviously, in a few months when Benoit defeats Sid and, and takes the title. Um, but Benoit looked good in, in, in the loss here, looks strong in defeat. Um Obviously, there's a huge uh, size difference here, but Benoit can work with anybody. It doesn't matter. What do you think here about Sid going over and Sid winning the U.S. title from Benoit? Kevin was really high on Sid. The rest of us were really high on Benoit, and he didn't get hurt at all because later on down the line, in a few months, he's going to win the world title. It got to show that he could work with a big guy, not get hurt, and get the big guy over, so they both walked out pretty unscathed. To me here, does Sid need the U.S. title, though? Does he need to be the U.S. champ? 
No, I think he needed something coming in with all the calamity that we've been through. You know, Kevin was the one that said, hey, we can't be switching the belt like this. When you look at it, Benoit wins the title you know, months later and leaves. Do you think this loss here, he was pissed? They're like, oh, I'm no, losing. No. No? No. Hey, you got to know your place. As great as he was. He's going against the guy that drew nothing but money in his lifetime, right? Sid, six, eight. Chris was five, seven. Sid's right at 300. Chris, 220. Yep. It didn't hurt him. It made him stronger. It made it believable when he won the belt later on down the line. I don't think he'd be pissed about knowing where he was going. I liked it. Pretty good match. Not nothing great. I think their, their match later on at sold out would, would be better, but that pretty good match uh, for the most part from Sid and Benoit. I mean, Benoit could work with anybody. I mean, let's forget about it. Right. right. The next match up Goldberg, Bill Goldberg defeats diamond Dallas page in nine minutes. Again, pretty good match. Nothing great. We would see better from them a year earlier at Halloween havoc 98, which is an unbelievable match, but Goldberg gets the win here. DDP doesn't look bad in a very physical match. Uh, it goes about nine minutes and Goldberg gets the victory. Is that about, um, what should have happened? Obviously, you know, DDP doesn't look, you know, doesn't look bad in the loss, but Goldberg needs to go over. Absolutely. It's Bill Goldberg. Now, I've interviewed DDP before, and he was saying, I know you were you were kind of laughing about it. I mentioned this a while ago to you, that he should have beat Goldberg at Halloween Havoc 98 and won the title. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if I could hit a slider, I would have been playing left field instead of rice. <laughs> Hey, that Jim Rice was a hell of a hitter. Yeah. Yeah. I was better. Just couldn't hit a slider. I just think that so many guys are like, oh, I shouldn't have ended the streak. I shouldn't have ended the streak. Yeah. Like DDP, he's kind of fallen right into that trap there, like of the guys who should have ended it. But it wouldn't have made sense at that point, though. Babyface, babyface. Did DDP really need that? To, I mean, you know, did Goldberg really need that? I don't know. <laughs> Let's. Close our eyes. Go back when Goldberg first came. Or at the Georgia Dome, right? 43,000 people going, Goldberg, Goldberg. Now let's close our eyes, open them again, pretend we're there again, and we hear, Diamond Dallas Page calling Diamond Dallas Page. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Howard Fine and Howard. <laughs> Fuck, come on. That was a phenomenon. Page worked his ass off, bust his ass, but he, at that period, nobody was Bill Goldberg. So, as far as the main event is concerned, Sting defeats Hulk Hogan, like we mentioned before, by turning heel for the WWE Championship. Sting wins in 12 minutes and 25 seconds. Not a great match here. It was okay. Uh, the end was great. I liked the surprise by Sting. I was totally shocked by him turning heel, although the crowd not necessarily buying it. DDP comes out at one point. Bret Hart is out there. Lex Luger is out there. DDP, Luger, kind of more the heels. Bret Hart is actually being a babyface trying to help Hogan. It just seemed like a little overbooked, a little bit of a cluster, and then all of a sudden Sting grabs the bat from Luger, nails Hogan with it, puts him in the Scorpion death, uh, death lock, and Hogan is out cold. Sting is the new champ. Yeah. Overbooked? What, wasn't there a lemonade stand in there, too? <laughs> Could have been. They bring down, didn't Paige bring down a lemonade stand that said, I, I should be Goldberg? I'm not sure. I, uh, yeah, it was, of course, it was overbooked. Of course. I mean, come on. When I see that shit like that, you know what I think about? You know the song, Bringing the Clowns? Yes. They should have big rubber balls on their noses when there's 10 guys running around. 
Almost kills the finish, though. Like of, of Sting turning heel, it kills yep. the finish. Yep. Absolutely. They could have done a finish where Luger went, the referee doesn't take a referee bump, but he gets spun around. Luger goes to hit Hogan. Sting grabs the bat for him, shoves Luger down. Hogan kneels Sting. Goes to cover him. Fucking Sting kicks out. The referee gets squashed by Hogan. Sting picks up the bat, whacks Hogan with the bat. Referee's down, covering one, two, three. And it gives a reason for Sting to say, I took the bat away from Luger, and you son of a bitch, you hit me. Cost him some kind of controversy. Not everybody coming down with lemonade stands. Sometimes it's the way to get to a place is a straight line. So, so anyway. Why no war games? Because Fall Brawl has always it's been associated with war games since 93. It's supposed to be Fall Brawl war games. Why no war games? I think they want a complete change from what Eric had put out. They feel it wasn't working? It obviously wasn't. It wasn't. But war games seemed like it always drew decently, or it always did pretty well. I think they wanted to try to erase Eric's, because they thought everything was coming from Eric. They didn't know Dusty created war games. I think they were trying to erase Eric at this time. To me, that's disappointing. Like, oh man, war games. That was kind of like, I don't know, something at least to get into for for the fall brawl event. Like, even if it wasn't that great, you're just into it. Love war games. Such a cool concept. Yeah, I did too. But I, that's why I think I may be way off base. But I would say they came down with either no more war games. AW now there's blood and guts. They copied off of it. WWF Survivor Series is now called War Games. So Triple H said there's going to be like he did in NXT, male and female war games. Which obviously, you know, he's a Dusty disciple for his booking. He got that from Dusty. He admits he got that from Dusty. I mean, they they always mention him. So Triple H is going back to war games. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I did. I'm glad. Good for them. You like that? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's a. Uh... You know, Ducks Dusty's legacy and should be kept. Weird that Vince never did war games. Like as soon as Vince has gone to a place, like boop, war games is on the main roster. Like it, it, no brainer to me. Think you want to give Dusty that credit? Please. Please. H does. Triple H does. Different person. So what do you give this event? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. Uh, thumbs in the middle, kind of pointing down, though. I feel like the opener, Filthy Animals against Vampiro and the ICP, the Dark Carnival. I felt like that was uh, pretty good. Lane versus Katsayashi was good. I like Vicious and Benoit. I like Goldberg and DDP. And I the turn was shocking, but I didn't really like Sting Hogan that much. So better than the last few WCW pay-per-views, but not great. Like, not... I guess in the middle, why we get the same way? You had you had your moments, but then you had some uh, some big stinkeroos in there too. Yeah, yeah. So what would you put it at? Right in the middle. Okay, okay. Wouldn't to go up or down? I put it right in the middle because there was some good stuff, there was some bad stuff, but nothing that I would put my thumb up for. Okay. So let's head towards the plugs. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website tmptempire.com. Of course, follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks and go to Pro Wrestling Tees, Pro Wrestling Tees.com. Go to the Kevin Sullivan store. Kevin, what else you got going on? Well, I'm down visiting my lovely daughter in Florida and I got nothing going on, so I'm having a good time. Nice. That's uh, the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'd like to thank everybody. For, oh, you got something else there? Okay. No, I said thank you. Oh, I thought you were gonna say, "Oh, I'm gonna go fishing. I'm gonna go hunting." I thought you were gonna say something. Now. No, no fishing. Well, I'm surprised. No fishing. Oh, I will be going, but not not for a couple of days. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you right back here next week for a little Task Mister Talks with Kevin Sullivan. We'll see you next week, folks.